One of the great targets is the heart. I'm not talking about the physical heart, though they are connected. I'm talking about the, the heart vortex within the human energy field. Um, the heart chakra or wheel of light, as they call it in the East. And, and you know, we think of love in a certain way, uh, being attracted to somebody or loving your kids. But actually, what I'm talking about, and I talk about this a lot in The Answer, it's very different. It includes that, of course. But, but, but love in its true sense does not say, I want the best for my kids, although we do, of course we do. It says I want the best for everybody. Um, and when you open this, it's not just love in the sense that people perceive it. It opens you to infinity. It's our connection to all that is, has been and ever can be. And through that connection, you um, have insight, you have um, knowing. This is, this, when people have intuitive knowing, where do their hands go? Look, mate, I just know, I just know. This knows, because it does know, because it's connected to that which does know. And when you open your heart, you're opening your connection to a level of awareness that allows you, first of all, to see the connections, because you're coming from that level where everything is one, therefore you can see the connections in the reality you're experiencing. But one definition I would give for this kind of love is the absence of fear. I would call evil the absence of love. I think that's what evil is, it's the absence of love. You infuse um, love into evil, it's not evil anymore. It's the absence of love. And this is what this cult is, it's the absence of love. That's why it does what it does. But it's also the absence of fear. Because once you, once you open to this insight, this self-identity, you know there's nothing to fear. Because whatever happens, whatever experiences we're having, there'll be another one along in a minute. We are always an expression, a point of attention within all that is, has been and ever can be. And however bad the experience we're currently having, that is what we always are. All that is, has been and ever can be. And so um, this does not fear. This will always do what it knows to be right and therefore does not consider consequences for doing what it knows to be right because it would never consider doing anything but what it knows to be right. Thus, consequences are irrelevant. This says, I'd like to do this, but what are the consequences? And you'll always find a list of consequences why you wouldn't do it. This says, I do what I know to be right. Consequences, therefore, are not even a conversation. And one of the great fears that people have, uh, well, it's the foundation fear, I think, is the fear of the unknown, which manifests as the fear of death. And the manipulation of the fear of death is, is the manipulation of this pandemic. Intellect will be useful only depending upon what it is identified with and what is held, what holds this, how steadily. So the next dimension of the mind, the first one is called as buddhi, which is the intellect. The second one is called as ahankara. Ahankara does not mean ego, this, that, it means the identity. Whatever you identified with, your intellect functions only around that. Simple. If you just identify with a nation, if you say, I'm an Indian, everything Indian looks beautiful. If you cross the border and you say you're something else, all that looks beautiful. So whatever you identified with, it's only with that the intellect functions. So ahankara is the identity. How consciously and how steadily your ahankara has been created will determine the effectiveness of your intellect. Just because it's sharp, it does not mean it'll be effective because sharp intellect or a sharp knife can cause any amount of damage to you. If you have a sharp knife and you don't have a steady hand, 
you will cut yourself all over the place. That's all that's happening. Human suffering is just this. You don't know how to hold this intellect in your hand properly. Every day you're cutting yourself. So all suffering is on self-help because your own mind causing this to you all the time. No matter what happens, people suffer, whichever way they suffer because they don't know how to hold this intellect. If you had the mind of an earthworm, you would be quite peaceful. Yes? You're trying to do it in so many ways to reduce the sharpness of the intellect by drink, by drug, by overeating, by doing all kinds of things somehow to take away the sharpness because the damn thing hurts. It hurts not because that's its nature, it hurts because you do not know how to hold it. The next dimension of the mind is called as manas, which is a huge volume of memory. It is not here or there, entire body carries memory. So mano maya kosha, this is called a huge sack of memory. This memory is in various stacks, we'll not go into all these details considering some people have said a clear no. They don't want to have a mind, I'm sorry, they don't want to know anything about the mind <laughs> So the fourth dimension of the mind is called as chitta. Chitta means it's pure intelligence. It is unsullied by memory. It has no trace of any kind of memory, it's just pure intelligence. If you touch this, then you have access to what you're referring to as the source of creation because all kinds of things might have been fed to you, God is this, God is love, God is compassion, God is kind, whatever, whatever. <laughs> Somebody come, stand on the edge of this stage, say all the prayer you want to say and fall. Let me see whether compassion happens to you or a cracked bone happens to you. I would like to check, all right? All these things have been made up because whatever somebody is deprived of, they will attribute that quality to their idea of God. God said He will give you beauty for ashes. But here's the key, you have to let go of the ashes before you receive the beauty. You can't go around hurt, living offended, upset, and see the new things God has in store. You have to clear out the clutter, that's what makes room for God to give you the beauty. The mistake we make sometimes is we think we have to get even. We have to pay people back. No, that's not your job. If you'll turn it over to God, He'll be your vindicator. He'll bring justice into your life. He saw every hurt, every wrong, every person that took advantage of you. I've learned God will vindicate you better than you can vindicate yourself. David said, God will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That means when God brings you out, those people that did you wrong, the people that tried to hold you back, they will see you promoted, honored, in a position of influence. God is not going to vindicate you in private. He's going to do it in public. So your enemies see you blessed, favored, successful. When my dad went to be with the Lord and I stepped up to pastor the church, I was very insecure. I had never ministered before. One Sunday, right after I first started speaking, I was walking through the front lobby and I overheard these two older ladies talking. One said, he's not as good as his father. The other answered, yeah, I don't think he's going to make it. That was the last thing I needed to hear. It was like my worst nightmare. I was tempted to shrink back, think I can't do this, nobody's going to listen to me. But I felt something rise up in me so strongly, I thought, who are they to tell me what I can't do? They didn't breathe life into me. They don't determine my destiny. They didn't know me before I was formed in my mother's womb. I don't need their approval. I don't have to have them to be for me. I did what I'm asking you to do. I cleared out the clutter. And every time their voices came to my mind, I said, no thanks, I am well able. I am strong in the Lord. God being for me is more than the world being against me. And they still may not like me, but that's okay. When they turn on the television, they probably see me. When they're flipping through Sirius XM, they might hear me. 
What was that? God preparing a table in the presence of my enemy. When we were trying to acquire this building, the former compact center, a well-known business leader in Houston told a friend of mine that it would be a cold day in hell before Lakewood got the compact center. He was very against us. The company we were up against was much bigger, had many more resources, but God stepped in and made things happen that we never could make happen, and here we are today. But I can imagine every time that man drives down the freeway, sees our building with the big Lakewood sign, he must think it's a cold day in hell because here we are. What was that? God honoring us in front of the opposition. And I'm not gloating over it, not too much anyway, but here's my point. God knows how to vindicate you. It would be one thing if he did it in private. We would be grateful, but God is going to do it in public. He's preparing a table in the presence of your enemies. I lived in a car, dog. I ain't had no backyard. I ain't had no TV. I ain't had no phone. I ain't got no bathroom. I ain't got no sink. I asked God every day, could I be rich? I told God, if you let me make it, when I get there, I'm gonna, every chance I get, I'm going to tell everybody it was you. Here I am. And it was him. It was him. Now you got another route you want to take? Go ahead. See, the thing about having faith is you don't need nobody's permission. You don't have to take out a loan. You don't have to get accepted into the course. You can start your faith today. You can start your walk with God today. You ain't got to clear it with nobody. There's plenty of openings. He's available. All you got to do is go. I got rich, and I'm not bragging, but I'm just telling you, I got rich because I asked. It is an amazing scripture, man. If you would only ask, well, Steve, what do I ask for? Everything. Where do we go to get that energy we need and that fo to, to keep our focus and to keep our drive? Whenever you're moving from one level to the other and you have to reinvent yourself, the adjustment, it's very, very difficult, it's very, very challenging. And I think that you need to begin to remind yourself of your why. You know, Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, if you know why you're doing something, it will empower you to endure anything that you're going through. When you're working in corporations, you're working in financial services, it's a very competitive area. It's very, very dynamic. It's, this is the era that Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. And so people are tensed and, and very, very stressed out. So how do you deal with that? And, and knowing why you do what it is that you do. The name of the game right now is perceptual and psychological. It's the mental adjustments that we must make in the midst of the difficulties. That's what leaders do. Leaders don't panic. They are not intimidated by the change. They're not intimidated by the difficulties. What they are, they are empowered by it. I remember reading something that said, says not what you don't have is what you think you need that keeps you from handling the difficulties and the challenges of life. And we have everything we need within us to face and to deal with whatever we have at, at, at hand because we are more powerful than anything that we're up against. Now, these mental adjustments and this, uh, this idea that I've got what I need, I mean, in some ways, that represents who I am. For many years, I was living a life that I was not designed to do. I'm designed to speak. That's what I do. But for 42 years, I'm 62 now, for 42 years, I was doing something I wasn't designed to do because when I looked at what I wanted to do, that was to speak, to train, to empower people, that my inner conversation to myself was, Les Brown, you can't do that. You were labeled educable mental retarded in the fifth grade. You have no college training. You were born in an abandoned building on a floor. You don't even know your birth parents. You can't do that. You are DT. You were called the dumb twin. Those words became my reality for many years. And then someone came along and interrupted that conversation in my head and said, Mr. Brown, they tell me about to drop out of school. And, and I said, um, well, yes, why, I, I, I just, I can't, I'm not smart like my brother. And I'll never forget when we first met, I was in his class waiting on another student. And he came in and said, young man, go to this board and work this problem out for me. I said, sir, I can't do that. I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter. Follow my directions anyhow. And I said, I can't, sir. And he said, why? I said, sir, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. 
So now this man changed how I saw myself. When I saw myself as the dumb twin, and that was the conversation in my head, that was given to me, that's what I believed, I accepted that. So the things that I was up against academically, they began to appear not as difficult as I thought they were because now he empowered me. Before then, right before then, up to that point, the things that were placed before me, I would stumble, I would slow the class down because I was convinced that I was dumb. I believed what they said to me. And this guy came along and he changed my perception of myself. Someone said that people don't live life as it is, they live life as they are. And so what we have to do as leaders, I don't care where you are in customer service, managing people, that you have to do during the tough times, you have to bring the best out of yourself. So it's right now, it's at this time of the struggle. We go through a restructuring, we have competition that's doing weird stuff out in the market. Um, and, and what you're saying is it, it's right now that tests my mettle that, that builds me as a leader. Yes, uh, without any question, the sign that I saw the other day that said, if you're going through hell, don't stop. <laughs> Keep moving. You know, you've got to continue to move. And if you continue to move and make the adjustments and fine tune your strategy and, and let the people on the organization know, hey, look here, we're going to make this happen. And here's what they have to do. They have to come from a place of it's possible. And once people begin to know that it's possible, then they begin to work within that framework. Sometimes we have to be intelligently ignorant. Many people fail to achieve the goals that they're capable of doing because they judge according to appearances. They know too much and they think themselves out of it. What we have to do in this point in time, in this period of our history, is begin to be open to the possibility that it's possible, that we can do this. And the next step is that it's necessary. It's necessary that we find a way to make this work, that we look for ways to optimize the efficiency of our operation. It's necessary that everybody gets on the same page. It's necessary that we develop one vision, one voice, and higher standards on how we're going to begin to drive the culture, to impact our bottom line, to begin to take the level of customer service that we envision to another level to dominate the marketplace. It's necessary. Being second place is not name of the game. That's not acceptable. We've got to make it happen. And that it's you and it's me. All of us must take ownership for it. It was George Bernard Shaw who said the people that make it in life, they look around for the circumstances that they want and if they can't find them, they create them. That's what leaders do. And how do I take that, that picture that I have and get my employees to really see the possibility as well? Speed of the leader, speed of the group. You have got to buy into it. You've got to believe it. The difference between leaders and, and, and people that are followers. Leaders, it, it, it's, a, it's a whole different standard for them. You know, they, it's a difference between being in the business and the business being in you. That it has to be who you are and that you set the pace for the organization. If the leader becomes cynical, if there's any doubt, if you don't have absolute faith that you can make it happen, if you become cynical, if they sense that you don't believe that it can happen, if you start complaining about the fact that you can't get your higher ups to answer or there's so much political bureaucracy that we have to deal with, that you're frustrated, that you don't know what to do, that you're pulling your hair out, that you can't sleep at night because of the fact that it's out of your control. If you have that victim mindset and feeling powerless, that nonverbal communication communication, your facial expression, your energy, the spirit of who you are, that will permeate and contaminate the spirit of the organization. Many leaders, their effectiveness with their people, their impact, their influence begins to diminish because they don't take the time to shop in their minds, to build their faith, to build their skills, to empower and increase their confidence in themselves. So part of what we have to do, all leaders, you have to take time to pour into yourself and you've got to also reach out. You've got to have a board of advisors and, and it's your support committee that will give you a home court advantage. More teams win on at home than they do on the road. 87% why? Because they have people cheering for them. I think that all leaders should have people around them, their group, their mastermind group that will help to pour into them. There's safety in counsel that they can talk to. One of the things I always tell leaders that ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong and ask for help and don't stop until you get it. What do I do if, if I'm just not interested in playing this game? You know, it's easier 
maybe I'll just coast it out. You know, some of us have been had our careers for a long time. Yes. Can't I just mark time until this passes or, you know, until something you, new you comes You can't along? do that. You, you, can, you can become a volunteer victim and choose to play your life out like that. What if you live your whole life only to discover that it was wrong? You must fight and you must believe. Fight for the love that you have inside of you. Believe in everything that you are putting forward and leave the rest behind you. What you are looking for and what you are fighting for depends on you. Let this be a lesson, not only for yourself, but for the rest of the world that is watching you. Make your stand. Make your stand for the right reasons. Make sure everything that you believe in stays with you. Because the moment you are faced with any challenge, there is no turning back. When there are multiple challenges coming at you, when everything that is trying to destroy your idea of being your best, keep your eyes on the prize and move forward. Your time is now. Make sure you make that moment count. If you believe that you are a champion, then stand on it. Because that is ultimately what champions are made for. Success requires that you stare into the eyes of the things that make you feel uncomfortable. You have to learn how to master that fear. Every time that it arises on the inside of you, you've got to reach in there and pull it out and place it on your opponent, on the obstacle or the challenge that you're facing. Every time that fear knocks, you answer the door with faith. For the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. You either master that fear, or that fear is going to master you. Because every time you give into that fear, a piece of your life dies. So I want you to make a decision right here. And right now, draw a line in the sand and say, I will not live this way. Fear cannot have me anymore. Nelson Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Now I will say it again, to go to the next level, you must boldly and aggressively attack the things that scare you. You must learn to look at that fear in the eye and the things that make you feel uncomfortable and say, so what? You will not stand in the way of my greatness. Every time fear shows its face, you grab it by its neck and you choke the life out of it. Stop letting false evidence appearing real destroy your dreams. Fear is just faith in reverse. Arise, champion. Listen, getting successful, whatever you consider successful, if it's rich, whatever, it's not a magic trick. It's not God picks certain people he'll make rich and certain people he don't. He gives all of us as his children the power of choice. You have a say-so in that. You can decide to be rich and with God's help, it's highly doable. But you first have to think it. The difference between successful people and non-successful people is here. I'm no better than none of y'all. I'm not a better person than you. I'm not a better Christian than you. God don't love me more than you. None of that. Listen to me. It's not what makes it hard is your lack of belief that it can happen for you. The fact of it is, though, it's very doable. See, if but you got to change, though. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. So if you're at a place in your life and you ain't happy with it, you have to change some things. But you have to make a conscientious decision that you're going to change. 
and it's not dependent on anybody else. It don't matter what your mama think. It don't matter what your coworkers think. It don't matter what your siblings think. It don't matter what your children think. It don't matter. They have nothing to do with this. This decision is yours and yours alone. It's two people born in a hospital every day. It's a person that's born in a hospital that's gonna get a job and somebody born in a hospital that's gonna give them a job. You get to decide which one you're going to pick. You get to decide. Let me tell you something. You get to decide if I'm going to be rich, poor, mediocre, plentiful, happy, sad. You, you have a decision to make. Your mind, all right. Here we go. This is the teaching moment. Let me give you this so you can get on with your 2019. You walk in the house, you pick up the remote control. Let me teach you how this works. And you press the power button. When I told you 2019 will be the best year of your life, but you have to claim it. You have to expect it to be the best year of your life. You have to live your life with the expectation that great things are coming your way. And that's how it works. Now, let me teach it to you. You grab your remote, you press the power button. What do you expect to happen? You expect the TV to come on. Guess what? It come on. If you want to see sports, sir, Sports Center Channel 46, and you press 46 and OK or select, what do you expect to come on your TV? Sports Center. And guess what show up? Sports Center. They got the concept of creating a remote from the Bible. See, God is tied to all of this. You better understand what I'm trying to tell you. The Bible says... A man is as he thinking. God created us in his image. God thought of this world. He thought of it. So he created it. So he made you just like him. That your thoughts can create things. He made you just like him. Now you can't go make earth and heaven like he did but you can make a better world for yourself. There is a scripture, Habakkuk 2 and 2. It says, write the vision and make it plain so that he who reads it will run to it. And even though it tarry, tarry means take a long time, wait for it, for surely it will come at an appointed time. That's in the Bible. That ain't in the rich people's copy. <laughs> That's in everybody, everybody's Bible. The problem is everybody don't do it. But it's right there. But you got to do it. I'm just telling you, it's, if you don't do it, it's, it's, it's too hard. It's almost impossible. That vision board has changed. My life. Everything I put on my vision board, I get. Everything. Now, you have to understand something. It's not going to come when you want it to come. It comes at an appointed time. That's the trick, but the appointed time is what throw people off. Because most, see, when you ask God for something, he sends it, he ships it immediately. Soon as you ask him something, you really believe he'll do it, he boxes it up and he ships it to you immediately. The problem with the package is, he never gives you the date that the package is going to arrive. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Because if he told you the date that the package would rely, would arrive, it would destroy the requirement he has of all of us, which is faith. Faith is the belief in things that you cannot see. So if you ask God for a million dollars and he tell you, I'm going to give it to you in March of 2020, you wouldn't need no faith. You'd be talking to people crazy because you know in 2020, <laughs> I'm going to be a millionaire. But he sent a million soon as you ask for it. 
but it's going to come at an appointed time. The problem is people stop waiting on the package. Then when it get to you, because he delivers only to Faith Street, when he delivers to you on Faith Street, but you done stepped off of Faith Street, you over here on I Don't See How Circle. He don't ship there. Instead of staying on Faith Street, you done stepped over here to I Don't Believe It Boulevard or It Took Too Long Avenue. Then the package come to Faith Street is just like the post office in FedEx. If you ain't there to receive it, it got to go back. That's how it works, man. You have control of this. This belongs to you. This is yours. You're the captain. You're the master. You're the foreman. You're the general. You're the head. Don't give control of this to nobody, especially the devil. Do not let Satan come in here and function and operate because he has one mission to keep you off course, to make you not think it's possible, to make you think that God don't hear you. His job is only to destroy you, to make sure that you don't become what God intended for you to become. That's the mission of the devil. Now, if you don't believe in the devil, I, this conversation ain't for you. If you don't believe in God, this conversation ain't for you. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people who are spiritually based. If you get control of this, that's why I'm telling you these two books. I'm, now look, the, the, the best book you can read is the Bible. If you read the book of Proverbs, over and over and over is the book of wisdom and understanding. It would really help your life if you just read. I'm going to be honest with you. That's the only book in the Bible I've read cover to cover. I've only read the book of Proverbs. I've read some scriptures every now and then. I only know five or six scriptures by heart. I'm just going to be real with you. But I've memorized them five or six scriptures. And them five or six got me here today. I know a lot of people that know the Bible inside out. Ain't got nothing to show for it. You know why? Because they memorized it, but they didn't apply it. I have applied six scriptures to change my life. But these books that I told you about, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale and The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz, you know what it does? It just teaches you how this works. Once you get this, y'all, you can change everything. Do you understand negativity? Let me just give you this and I'm going to walk away. Negativity, you can protect yourself from negativity. And that's what stops most people, negative thoughts. You can coat your mind from negativity. It's a real simple exercise to do. I do it every morning before I walk out the door. So I walk out as a positive person. You know, I get tired sometimes. That's different from being negative. Because I get mentally drained from my job at times. But to coat your mind from negativity, the way you can put a coating around your mind is with one simple thing, gratitude. Gratitude erases negativity. I'm gonna show you how this works. If you wake up in the morning and you start having negative thoughts, man, this ain't my day. I woke up on the wrong side of bed. I'm tripping, I just don't feel myself. Every time you feel in the middle of the day, if you feel yourself doing that, Stop, just stop for a second and start going over in your mind everything you have to be grateful for. Not everything you want, everything you already have, because what you have is substantial. You just haven't gone over the list and taken inventory in a long time. But the fact that you can walk, that's a blessing. The fact that you woke up, that's another blessing. The fact that you can see, think, reason, that's another blessing. The fact that you can go somewhere and get yourself something to eat, that's another blessing. The fact that you can go and turn the key and call someplace home, that's another blessing. The ability to dream is a blessing. The, the, the fact that you have an opportunity to get it right is another blessing. The fact that you're beautiful, that's another blessing. The fact that you have any measure of health, 
that's another blessing. And I'm just talking to you, I don't even know you. I could give you 50 things you ought to be grateful for right now. I don't even know you. Start coating your mind with gratitude. It'll change everything for you. God is good, man. You ought to give him a chance to work in your life. Thank you all for coming. Life, there's three things. There's our ability to choose what we're focused on, or to commit, to, to get a result, to put all our intention and focus into something. There's our ability to do the right things, to have the right strategy to execute. And then there's some grace. There's what some people call luck, some people call grace. There's if you do the right things over and over again and with total focus, sometimes, you know, you get good fortune that comes your way. And you tend to have more good fortune when you're totally focused and decisive and you take lots of action than if you kind of just sit around and accept things like that like you don't have a future. What do you do like decades ago, half a century ago almost now, and someone says to you, go to the back of the bus and you're African American. One woman just decided, you know what? You can't take my dignity from me. I can only give that up, but I don't choose to give it up. And I will not go back to the bus. The answer is no. And Rosa Parks changed an entire society. Because that day she chose to focus on something else. She gave it a different meaning. This is not a command. You do not have control over me. And she decided to fight. And she changed the direction of a country and of many other countries. She started something. We forget that you don't have to be famous to have the ability to change at least your own personal history. Change the direction we go in our life. We have the power to choose, even if you haven't before. You can finally say, no more, I won't put up with that. Within myself or from anybody else. And here's what I'm going to do differently. That's where the breakthroughs really start to happen. Now the question is, why do some people stand their ground and make something change versus other people just kind of accept things. Why do some people make bold decisions and other people make decisions that are based on trying to hang on to what they've got? Well, that's a more complex question to answer than we might have in a few minutes in this one session, but it is one that I've spent my life studying because when you can change your decisions, you can change your life. When you can change the force that controls your decisions, you can change anything in your life. At some level, we have certain beliefs and values. But if I was going to make it simple, I'd say there's two things that determine your choices. The first thing is the state of mind and emotion you're in at that moment. Think about it. Have you ever snapped at somebody and had nothing to do with them? It was just the state you're in, right? You're frustrated, you're pissed off about something, and in that state of mind, whatever they said got interpreted through that state. And you made it a meaning like they're an irritant or they're interrupting you. They weren't. Probably felt bad afterwards. When we get in the wrong state, we make the wrong decisions. When you get in a strong, empowering state, you'll make a better decision. Learning how to direct your state is a big part of what my work is with people, and it's a big part of what I do in my seminars. But the other thing that affects your decisions would be what I would call your story or your blueprint. We all have kind of a story about how our life is supposed to be. It comes from a set of life experiences, interpretations. Some people think life is all about getting theirs. Some people think life is about growing and contributing. Some people think life is about making judgments. Some people think life is about saving other people's lives. Some people think life is about being successful. Some people think God is the basis of everything and the way to know God is to go through life in a very specific way with a set of rules and they follow it. And that's what they believe. Whatever your story is, whatever your blueprint, your blueprint is just another way of saying whatever you believe is how your life is supposed to be, at some level, we either follow that blueprint or we fight it. If we follow it or we fight it, we're going to find that we're going to bump into things in life where life isn't always the same as we expect it to be or think it should be. And that's when we start to experience stress. When you make love, you breathe in unison while you're making love. And invariably the guy would go, huh? And I'd say, let me explain. You're here telling me about all these things you're upset with each other about. And you can talk about these things to your blue in the face, but the real problem is you don't feel connected. You don't feel well. And I said, you don't have that feeling of total oneness with each other. 
and talking more about this is not going to change it. So if you really want to change this, I suggest you do this. And if you do what I'm telling you, you still need me, I'll give you one of my lunches. So I, I want, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and I want you to make love for an hour and a half minimum. And while you're doing it, I want you to breathe in unison the entire time with each other. Because what happens is you feel totally connected as one. Out of, who knows, three to four dozen people I asked to do that, only one person ever called us back and wanted to be able to do a session. Because the bond is there. So try it. Not now, later this evening. <laughs> Plus, the great thing about mirroring somebody's breathing, it's very subtle. No one's going to jump on their chair and say, Would you stop mirroring my breathing? And they're not going to notice. So you got breathing, you got posture, you got gestures, you got facial expressions, you got eye contact. What else could you mirror? Come on, use your brain. I know the answer. I want to see if you can come up with it. Come on. What else could you mirror? Proximity. Good. What does proximity mean? Proximity means everybody has a certain amount of space that they need to be comfortable. And it's different for every single person you're going to meet in your life. One skill you want to master in this day and age that we live in, if you want to have an extraordinary life, it's the ability to learn rapidly. Because today, there is more opportunity to do more things, learn things, create things, experience things than any time in human history. But most people are way, way, way behind the times unless they grew up with technology and learning. So I would like to start this morning by showing you the strategy for learning. What is learning? So if we take a human being, and uh, this will be a drawing of a human being, so you can see that again I majored in art. Magnificent, isn't it? <laughs> so if we take a human being, and we want to be able to have them learn something, what is learning? Well, learning is the creation that does not represent the highest in me. You decided that even though I have eight children that I'm not taking care of, I just see women as, as a receptacle for my orgasms. You decided that you're going to throw your life away for crap. you look in the mirror, you should have contempt for who's looking back at you. Because now you're no good to yourself or those eight children that you have. Don't tell me about the man. Tell me about the man in the mirror. And look at your life. Here's what I know. You are stronger than anything that you're facing. Anything. And when you harness your will, when you retrain your thinking, when you jump out of line, when you decide to become an independent thinker, when you make decisions, see, if you just do two or three things well, listen to me. If you do two or three things well and just make the decisions not to do a variety of things wrong, like following the crowd, like doing drugs, like drinking and pottering and pottering and, and, and wasting valuable time. If, if you decide to not to do a lot of things wrong, you can make it in this thing called life. What I've learned is that there, I can break it down into four pieces, right? There are four, four things, four characteristics. One is parenting, the other one is uh, technology, the third is impatience, and the fourth is environment. The generation that we call the millennials, too many of them grew up um, subject to, not my words, failed parenting strategies, you know? Where, for example, they were told that they were special all the time. They were told that they could have anything they want in life just because they want it, right? They were told, um, uh, some of them got into um, honors classes not because they deserved it, but because their parents complained. And some of them got A's not because they earned them, but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. Some kids got participation medals. You got a medal for coming in last, right? 
which the science we know is pretty clear, which is it devalues the medal and the reward for those who actually work hard. And that actually makes the person who comes in last feel embarrassed because they know they didn't deserve it. So it actually makes them feel worse, right? So you take this group of people and they graduate school and they get a job and they're thrust into, an, into the real world. And in an instant, they find out they're not special. Their moms can't get them a promotion. Um, that you get nothing for coming in last. And by the way, you can't just have it because you want it. Right? And in an instant, their entire self-image is shattered. And so you have an entire generation that's growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations. The other problem to compound it is we're growing up in a Facebook, Instagram world. In other words, we're good at putting filters on things. We're good at showing people that life is amazing even though I'm depressed. Right? And so everybody sounds tough. And everybody sounds like they got it all figured out. And the reality is there's very little toughness and most people don't have it figured out. And so when the more senior people say, well, what should we do? They sound like, this is what you got to do. And they have no clue. <laughs> so you have an entire generation growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations, right? Through no fault of their own, through no fault of their own, right? They were dealt a bad hand.